Welcome to lesson 13 in the story of Joseph. This will actually be our final lesson. It's entitled East from West, Genesis chapter 49 and chapter 50. Last time we saw that God's grace has a sovereign way about it, which is to say it's never ever fair. Grace is often defined as unmerited favor, meaning we do absolutely nothing to deserve it. But grace is more than even that. Joseph's story reveals grace is demerited favor. We do absolutely everything to deserve the opposite, and this actually makes grace quite uncomfortable. For example, as the famine gets worse and worse, Joseph keeps taking and taking from the Egyptians who served him and were grateful to him, but he keeps giving and giving to the members of his family who had sold him into slavery and lived for years as if he was dead. May we never lose sight of this, that grace is free but never cheap. Grace is incredibly costly for the giver. God had to take everything from his one and only son in order to give us, his adopted sons and daughters, what we so desperately need but could never earn. Forgiveness, reconciliation, redemption. He took his son's life to give us life. Grace is so much more scandalous than unmerited favor. It is indeed demerited favor. We don't just do nothing to deserve it. We do all kinds of things all the time to deserve the opposite. Today, as Joseph's story comes to a close, we consider four scenes, but we'll spend the majority of our time on the third one. First, Jacob gathers his sons and blesses them. Second, Jacob dies, and his sons lead a funeral procession back to Canaan to bury him. Third, Joseph reassures his brothers that he has forgiven them. And finally, Joseph dies and is buried in Egypt. At the beginning of chapter 49, Jacob gathers all his sons and tells them what's going to happen to each of them in the future. His predictions are called blessings, but you don't even have to read them closely to notice that some of them are not blessings at all. They're anti-blessings. For example, Reuben is cursed because of his sexual sin, while Simeon and Levi are cursed because of their anger and cruelty. By contrast, Judah and Joseph receive a long litany of true blessing. The rest of Jacob's sons receive a complex and somewhat confusing mixture of blessings and curses, which often includes a comparison to some kind of animal. Isaacar is a raw-boned donkey, Dan is a snake, Naphtali is a doe, and Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. Bruce Waltke writes, the covenant family's future includes trouble as well as prosperity. Why? Because being in covenant relationship with God is not always pleasant. Every day with Jesus is not necessarily better than the day before. Is this not your experience? Hope mixed with despair, joy balanced with sadness, pleasure accompanied by pain. You see, the Bible is always talking about life the way life really is. You see this right in the middle of Jacob blessing his sons. In verse 18, he prays, I look for your deliverance, Lord, because sometimes this is the only prayer we can muster as we try to make sense of all the brokenness around us and inside us. Jacob then dies in verse 33 of chapter 49, but right before he dies, he tells his sons to bury him with his family in Canaan, in the same cave where Isaac and Rebekah, Abraham and Sarah are. And this is significant. Jacob dies in Egypt, but his heart is still in Canaan. He'd rather be buried with his fathers than beside Rachel, who was the love of his life. At the end of his life, Jacob placed greater worth on his covenant relationship with God than his romantic relationship with Rachel. Now, I'm not suggesting his marriage to Rachel wasn't a good thing. It was, but often, and is this not the same for us, Jacob was tempted to make a good thing the only thing, the ultimate thing, more significant than his relationship with God. He may have chosen to be with Rachel exclusively in life, but when he dies, he chooses to rest with his fathers. 
After Jacob dies, Joseph, who continues to wear all his emotions on his sleeve, throws himself on his father, weeps over him, and kisses him in verse 1 of chapter 50. Then right on cue, as he always seems to do after experiencing such emotion, he goes back to work taking care of his family. In verse 7, Jacob's sons lead a funeral procession back to Canaan to bury their father. And remarkably, many Egyptians go with them. Verse 3 reveals that the Egyptians mourned Jacob's death for 70 days prior to many of them joining the covenant family on their journey back to Canaan. They clearly loved Joseph since he had saved them from the famine. And this large company in the funeral procession not only included all the members of Joseph's household and his father's household, but as I've already said, Egypt. All Pharaoh's officials, all the dignitaries of Egypt go to. And I think this begs an intriguing question for us as Christians today. How many non-Christians will mourn for us when we're gone? Will any unbelievers be there to comfort us when we lose someone we love? Jacob and Joseph live an incredibly rare kind of life. They were blessings to members of God's family, but also to those outside God's family. I think this means we should always be asking ourselves as a church, are we seeking to bless those outside our church as much as we are seeking to bless those inside our church? After all, as someone once said, the church is the only community in the world that exists for the sake of its non-members. We're just not here for ourselves. We are here for those who aren't here yet. Now let's transition to what I think may be the most comforting, but at the same time most convicting passage in Joseph's story. It's comforting because we all long to be forgiven, but it's convicting because we are also called to forgive. So in what follows, prepare to be comforted, but also prepare to be convicted. The gospel often wounds us before it can heal us. Have you ever sinned against someone, asked their forgiveness, received their forgiveness, but then struggled to know whether or not you've really been forgiven? And I'm not talking about minor offenses. I'm not talking about little white lies or failing to show up on time, forgetting to take out the trash or not putting the seat up before you go. I'm talking major betrayal of trust. Deep, dark secrets you've hidden for years. Abuse, malice, slander, other forms of relational fracturing. I'm talking selling your brother into slavery and assuming he's been dead for years kind of stuff. So have you ever sinned big time against someone else? Asked their forgiveness, received it, but then started to doubt it? You once heard the words, I forgive you, but it feels like you're walking on eggshells whenever you're around the person you sinned against, wondering, have I really been totally and completely forgiven? This is the position Joseph's brothers find themselves at the end of his story. Verse 15 records them asking a question. What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? As their family is making this long journey back to Egypt, I imagine the brothers having a conversation that goes something like this. You know, guys, now that dad is dead, Joseph has no reason to keep taking care of us. You're right. Maybe he just acted like he forgave us to comfort dad. Oh, and now that dad's gone, isn't it possible that he's planning to give us what we deserve? I mean, Benjamin, you're probably safe because you didn't do what we did, and Joseph clearly loves you, but man, it could be payback time for the rest of us. All of a sudden, in chapter 50, the pain of what they did to Joseph comes back on them in full force. And have you ever experienced this? You seek forgiveness, receive forgiveness, but... The thought still haunts you. Have I really been forgiven? Is this really going to last? Can I trust it? The fear can paralyze you, which is exactly what happens to Joseph's brothers. They can't even approach him and ask him. Instead, they send him a message and it says, Your father left these instructions before he died. 
This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins of the servants of the God of your father. They're trying to get out ahead of it. But when Joseph receives their message, he once again has an emotional reaction. He weeps. Why would he weep? Well, think about it. Yes, there's the pain of wondering if you've really been forgiven, but there's also the pain of not being able to persuade someone that you have forgiven, that you've really forgiven them. The brothers remember their sin, but they doubt Joseph's forgiveness, so they're paralyzed with fear. Meanwhile, Joseph has forgotten their sin, offered them full forgiveness, But he remains now as perplexed as they are paralyzed as to why they just can't receive it. It's like his brothers are shamefully asking, have you really let this go? And Joseph is screaming through his tears, yes, I really have let it go. Man, this is such a human drama. You can relate to both sides at nearly every turn. I think Joseph's story is the best story I've ever read about forgiveness because it's so human. It includes all the elements we experience when we sin against other people or are sinned against by other people. When we need to be forgiven or we need to forgive. How do you know when you've really been forgiven? And how do you know when you've really forgiven someone else? This story answers both questions. You know you've really been forgiven by someone you've sinned against when you no longer feel the guilt to keep on asking for forgiveness. And you know you've really forgiven someone else who has sinned against you when you weep over them because they can't receive fully the forgiveness you so desperately want them to have. Imagine being Joseph's brothers. Imagine having done what they did then having received his pardon, but you're still full of doubt and fear. So much so you fall at his feet and exclaim, we will be your slaves. But then in response to your desperation, as tears stream down your face, you see tears stream down his face as he moves towards you and warmly declares, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. He doesn't ignore what they did to him. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Then he has the grace to tell them again, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And then the narrator offers the most beautiful comment. He reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph simply could not stop telling them how much he loved them. He tells them whatever they need to hear and however many times they need to hear it. Have you ever in your life experienced forgiveness like this? Because let me tell you, if you haven't, this is what you're dying to have. Free, full, repetitive if the need arises, forgiveness. One of the things Jesus said most often in the Gospels was, do not be afraid. He says the same words to us that Joseph said to his brothers. Joseph added this question, am I in the place of God? With the obvious answer, no, I'm not. But Jesus can actually say, do not be afraid because I am in the place of God. In fact, I am God. As amazing as Joseph's forgiveness of his brothers is, It pales in comparison to the forgiveness Jesus offers anyone who confesses their sins and asks to be forgiven. You don't even have to send a message to Jesus like Joseph's brothers sent to him. No, Jesus sends his message to us. And do you know what it says? It says, my child, your sins are forgiven. And even if you sin again in the future, I will speak up for you with my father and tell him, You cannot hold that against them. Remember, I paid for it once and for all. Do you need to be forgiven? Turn to Jesus and do not be afraid. Whatever evil you have done, he can transform it all to good. There's nothing more evil than a cross. And that's precisely what God used to forgive anyone who will turn to him, including you.
Now we need to shift from comfort to conviction. Do you ever have a hard time forgiving others? I, I get it. I do it. I don't do it. <laughs> and so did Joseph. In fact, so does Jesus. Because to forgive is to suffer. What I've tried to show you is how comforting this passage is if you need to be forgiven. But what you also need to know is how convicting it is if you're called to forgive. And here's the thing. You are called to forgive. Jesus doesn't mince words when it comes to forgiveness. In Luke 6, 37, he says, forgive and you will be forgiven. But how do I know when I've really forgiven someone? Honestly, I think it's a question many of us don't even want to consider that much because we we fear the answer may require more of us than we're willing to give. I distinctly remember the time my youngest brother, in response to my dad's command to behave from the front seat, declared from the back seat, behave? I don't want to behave. If you're honest, you may be saying, forgive? I don't want to forgive. You may even have very good reason. Perhaps the main reason is that you've been sinned against in some awfully horrific ways, ones that I can't even relate to. But I still encourage you to travel down this road of forgiveness that remains, no matter how difficult. One, because Jesus has forgiven you. And two, because Jesus wants to set you free. If you're a follower of Jesus or you want to be a follower of Jesus, the Bible is crystal clear, but mysteriously so. Receiving God's forgiveness is intimately connected with lavishing that same forgiveness onto others. It just is. One cannot happen without the other. The more you experience one, the more you experience the other. So to know if you've really forgiven someone, This story reveals there are two life-changing signs to look for. First, you know you've really forgiven someone when you have the opportunity to get even, to hurt the person who hurt you, and you don't do it. Joseph had the power to get revenge against his brothers multiple times, but he never took it. The second life-changing sign to look for is when you're able to see and to say what Joseph saw and said about those who sinned against him. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. And this is the toughest part. The good God intends is not necessarily your own personal good. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. Because what Joseph says is good in verse 20 has nothing to do with him but rather the saving of many lives. Now, sure, technically speaking, this included his own life. But think of all the sacrifices Joseph had to make to save the many lives he's referring to. The good God intended through the harm his brothers caused was not Joseph's good. Rather, it was the good of other people. Do you see it? As we come to the end of Joseph's story, do you see it? If I held up a picture of Joseph and asked you, who's this a picture of? I hope, though you may be tempted to say the obvious, which of course would be Joseph, that instead you would pause, maybe a smirk would even appear on your face, and you would joyfully say, no, I see it. I see a picture of Jesus. Joseph's story is about Jesus. And if you long to know that you are forgiven, and you also long to know how to forgive, especially in response to being forgiven, then your story is also about Jesus. Amen.